。人类对宇宙的好奇从未停止。2012年，在距离地球七千万公里外的火星，一辆不可思议的车满载着人类的好奇心，惊险着陆。那是一次没有成功先例可以参考的冒险。如今，两千多个日夜过去，这辆伟大的火星车依旧在不休地工作着，仿佛翘首期盼着人类的到来。这一次恰到好处的疯狂背后，让我们一同寻找独立思考的原点时刻。接下来，有请 NASA 喷气推进实验室好奇号火星车首席机械工程师 Adam s t e l t z n e r 先生，为我们带来分享：好奇、独立思考的原点。Good morning, Geek Park. This is a movie taken as we landed on Mars. It was a very difficult movie to make. Truth be told, my team just held the camera. As this movie is being filmed, this camera is strapped to the world's largest extraterrestrial rover, named Curiosity. And as she shoots this movie, she is hanging two and a half miles in the sky above Mars. Underneath the world's largest supersonic parachute, her name is Curiosity, and it is a very appropriate name. Curiosity is the spark, and exploration is the fire that burns from that. Spark. Exploration takes us to new destinations, new realms of discovery, and of independent thought. This is where our exploration takes us. Now, my journey of curiosity did not start on Mars, but it started here. This is. The Golden Gate Bridge, the San Francisco Bay Area, where I was a boy. This image is apropos because of the stars that you see in the night sky, the constellation of Orion. See, as a student, as a young boy. And as a young man, I was a very poor student. And when I was 21, I was playing rock and roll in the San Francisco Bay Area, hoping to become a rock star. I had not had good education in my schooling, and one night. Returning home from seeing, from playing a show, from performing a show, I saw that the stars were in a different place in the night sky than they had been when I went out to load in to the show. The stars were that constellation of Orion, although I did not know its name at the time. See, I had paid so little attention in school that I had missed the whole Earth spinning on its axis thing. I was curious about the apparent motion of the stars in the night sky. But most importantly, I followed my curiosity. My curiosity led me to the local college to go back to school. To teach me why the stars had moved, I fell in love with the idea of understanding my universe, of understanding not only why the stars moved, but how 
we can build things here on earth to reach the stars. That journey of curiosity changed the course of my life. If Adam of yesteryear were to know what Adam of today's job is, his head would explode. But thank goodness we never really know where our journey of curiosity just might take us. So let's talk about Mars. For years, for eons, Mars has captivated our attention. Before we had aids to our vision, we looked up at the night sky and we saw a light a little redder, a little brighter than the other lights in the celestial sphere. When we first got crude telescopes, we looked up and we saw life. We saw roadways and canals. We saw civilization. And then we got better telescopes. And we realized that those are just natural images on the surface of Mars. But we never lost the idea that maybe Mars is alive. It's understandable. It's a profound question. Are we alone in our universe? Are we alone in our solar system? Could one of our nearest neighbors harbor life? NASA has been sending rovers to Mars to try and answer that question, to try and unlock the mysteries of if Mars was ever alive. Here is a family portrait of the rovers we have taken to Mars. Starting in 1997 with a little tiny Sojourner rover the size of a microwave oven. She was important because with her we were able to get to the surface of Mars for much less money than we had ever been able to get there before. L less than a factor of 1 over 10 was the cost of Pathfinder compared to the 1970s missions of Viking. We were so excited by that success that we pledged NASA would go back year after year. Every opportunity we could, the way that Mars and the Earth go around the sun, those opportunities happen every 26 months. But the head of NASA pledged we will go every 26 months. But there are more than 26 months between Sojourner and the next mission. And that is because we had failures. If you are really trying hard, if you are operating at the edge of what you can do, you will fail. That is not bad. That is teaching you what the threshold of your capacity is. We rallied, we pulled back from the edge of the cliff, and in 2004, we put twin rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, on the surface of Mars. They were important for this question about Mars and life because they taught us that liquid water had been on the surface of Mars. And we know from here on Earth, where there's liquid water, there's life. But they couldn't tell us some important things about the water. Was it salty or sweet, acidic or basic? In short, was the early wet Mars habitable for life? Well, in comes curiosity. 900 kilograms, huge, chalk full of all the instruments that we would need to answer this question about habitability. But if your job is landing her, which was my job, landing her was hard. She is the biggest rover ever, and getting her safely to the surface of Mars 
was a very daunting task. Now, if you're going to the surface of Mars and you're taking anything bigger than a bread box or smaller than a house, you need to do four things. We call it entry, descent, and landing. That's three words, but there's really four pieces to the puzzle. Coming from Earth to Mars, you show up at Mars going about 10,000 miles an hour. On landing night, we were going over 13,000 miles an hour with curiosity, so fast that the kinetic energy, the energy of motion, could melt or vaporize the entire spacecraft. That is considered very bad. So we put the spacecraft in a shell. We put material that will smolder and won't burn on the shell, and we shed that energy to the atmosphere on Mars, burning a hole in the sky on Mars as we slow down. That process slows us down to about 1,000 miles an hour, still not slow enough to land on the surface of Mars, so we open up a parachute. In our case, the world's largest supersonic parachute, about the diameter of this room right here, giving us a neck-snapping 12 Gs of deceleration. That slows us down to about 100 miles an hour, still not slow enough to land on the surface of Mars, so we have to let go of that parachute and go on to rockets. Now, every single mission that's been to the surface of Mars successfully has used all of these three pieces. But then, depending on how good your rockets are, how good your sensors are, you end up with a last little bit of speed. We call it error velocity. One, five, ten miles an hour. For our case, for Curiosity, it was one and a half miles an hour, about two kilometers an hour, this is this. Hardly any speed. The kinetic energy was a, less than a millionth of the arrival kinetic energy, and yet the engineering of that final piece gave us such great challenges. And we weren't just going anywhere on the surface of Mars. We were going a very difficult place to land. We were going here. This is the Gale Crater. It sits on the equator of Mars, a massive crater, 200 kilometers in diameter, and rising out of the floor of the crater, the massive Mount Sharp, almost 5,000 meters tall. NASA wanted us to land the spacecraft right there in the shadows, between the rock and the hard place. Images like this used to wake me up at night. In fact, images like this used to wake me up every night. 2.30 in the morning, I would wake up and I would worry. I would go down our risk list, the lists of things that we were, that the team was working through. And I would slowly walk down that list, counting them. Oh, the parachute, okay, well, we got the test, and then, and then the rockets, okay, but they got the fall of us and I would fall back to sleep. Some people count sheep to go to sleep. I counted ways to die on the way to Mars. And it was the final part that was the hardest. And for this, the team entered what we call the dark room, a place where we do not know the solution. If you are really trying to create something new, make something different, you will find yourself in the dark room. And for us, the dark room was that final piece of the puzzle. We tried everything. We started with airbags. This is how we had landed the little Sojourner rover and the twins Spear and an Opportunity. Unfortunately, when, with Curiosity being 900 kilos, there was no fibers known to humankind strong enough for us to make an airbag that would survive. So that was out. We thought about legged landers. We had landed on the moon with Apollo with a legged lander. We landed on Mars with Viking with legged landers. 
Unfortunately, one of the failures between 97 and 04 was a legged lander. And we refamiliarized ourselves with just how tippy a legged lander can be in uneven and uncertain terrain. Add a 900 kilo rover on top, it gets even tippier. We tried to solve that stability problem by adding legs, spreading the legs out, and letting the lander do a belly flop, land on its belly. Now, unfortunately, our fuel tanks are in the belly of the lander, and fuel for rockets is very explosive. And exploding on touchdown, that is also considered very poor form. So we armored up the belly of the rover, and by the time we were done, it was too heavy to launch. So in the fall of 2003, we gathered everybody together to try and think of a new way, a new solution, a way out of the dark room. And we came with this. We called it direct placement, but people called it the sky crane. And we knew two things when we left that room. When you have a solution that looks this crazy, people will question your credibility. Independent new ideas will sometimes look crazy. I was the one talking about the ideas, and I would feel my credibility drain into the floor. So I came up with a little statement I would make before I would ever start talking about the sky crane. It goes like this, great works and great folly may be indistinguishable at the outset. This means that if something's really different, you will not have a term of reference with which to understand it, and it will look crazy. This statement is both true and simultaneously meaningless. The meaninglessness is, of course, that crazy also looks crazy. Because, so just because you said this words doesn't mean that the next words out of your mouth are not absolutely whack. Now, the dichotomy between truth and craziness, truth and meaninglessness, it hung over the entire landing team because there was no test we could do on Earth that would teach us if we would be successful on Mars. We could do analyses, and we did. Pen and paper, computer simulation. This is one of eight million computer simulations we did before we'd ever think about launching our spacecraft. But anyone in this room who knows about computer simulation knows that simulations cannot protect you against the sins of omission, the I forgots. If I build a model of the landing in a computer, in ones and zeros, in software, and I forget an important feature to add to that model, the computer will not tell me this. It will just dutifully turn the crank on an adjacent universe that I've built inside the bowels of the box. And the results I get may or may not have anything to do with what we should reasonably expect when we get to Mars. So when it came right down to it, we had to collectively hold our breaths, gather the entire team together, and ask the question, had we done great folly or perhaps great work? Can you roll the video now? Coming up on entry. The vehicle reports entry interface. At this time, it will begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. The vehicle is just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. We have seen peak deceleration. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7.
parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Sea chill step has separated, we're on the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers and setting. Standing by for batch shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky green. Sky green is started. Eagle Dice, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. That was a good night. It did work. Curiosity took us on a journey to a new place in our solar system, to a new realm of discovery, to a place of independent thought. So here she is. Her name is Curiosity. She is doing our Curiosity's bidding on the surface of Mars. So what is next for NASA? Where will NASA's curiosity next take us? Well, the scientists of our world tell us that to really understand Mars, we must bring samples of Mars back to Earth. It is a very, very hard job but one that NASA is stepping up to. It takes a few missions to bring samples back from Mars, but the first of those is Mars 2020, and NASA is stepping up to that mission. I am the chief engineer. Could you roll the next video, please? This rover looks like Curiosity. It is about the same size of Curiosity, but it has the capacity to sample Martian materials, and it has a helicopter. This helicopter is a technology demonstration to show that helicopter technologies can work at Mars and allow further exploration in the future. Equipped with our sampling system and this helicopter, we will explore like never before. Doing such work is hard. We have been testing. Here is an example of helicopter tests in the Martian atmosphere, proving that we can operate in the atmosphere of Mars. Such successful tech tests suggest that we may, if the fates look well upon us, be successful flying a helicopter on the surface of Mars. So, we have tested our helicopter, we have tested our spacecraft, and in 2020, just a few short months, 14 months, from now, we will launch this beautiful spacecraft to Mars, and if the fates are with us, and if we've done all of our work correctly, we will go back to Mars. But the question I want to ask you is, curiosity has changed my life. It changed the course of my life. Through our work with developing spacecraft to go to Mars, we have found that if we keep our native human curiosity alive inside of us, we innovate better, our solutions are more successful, more competitive, more profound. So I would like you to ask this question of yourselves. Where will your curiosity next 
take you. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.